we are so blessed to have you too. So give us a little bit of an update on, on life. Introduce our family to your family. Yeah. Tell us about how many years you've been married, married kids, kiddos, yeah. all that Last four stuff. digits of your social security number. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, um, it's amazing to be here at Hope City. We hear about you guys around the world. Yes. Everybody's talking about what God is doing here. And uh, the half has not been told. There's a sweet presence of Jesus in this place. But anyway, we're Ken and Tabitha. We've been married for 24 years. Let's go. Come on, somebody. It has been the best 22 years of my life. <laughs> you do the math. The first two years was absolutely horrible. But now she got herself together and we are okay. alive. Okay. Praise God. Whatever. Listen to me. I said this That's last half service, true. but the only reason we invited you to ha is to have Tabitha here. You're a bonus. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just, yeah, she's, she's the real deal. But no, I was mean and selfish and arrogant and unfaithful and all of that natural carnal stuff for the first two years, but I got myself together and um, I'm a whole lot better now. Thank God for divine turnarounds. Yes. So that means that no matter where you currently are in your marriage, better is possible. Yes. Somebody shout better is possible. Better is possible. Awesome. Does anybody believe that today? Amen. And we are living witnesses of that. So tell them about how messy you, you were. You know, before you I do that, I will say that we, you know, we have three kids. Uh -huh. uh, Kenny is our youngest. He's 12 years old in middle school. Charity is our second at 14 in high school. And Hannah is our first. And she is 18, freshman at ORU, running cross country right. and track. It's all the emotions. All yes, those. we are everywhere right now. And it's crazy, but we're making the best of it. It's fun, right? And so, yes, um, you were crazy, okay, the first two years. Okay. But I was crazy as well. Okay, so I will own my crazy part of it work. because hey. most of the time in relationships, you know, it's 50-50. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, we, we both have a part to play. And so at the time, I was depressed. I had been depressed maybe for, tw for 10 years at that point. Um, I, I was sexually abused, physically abused, verbally abused growing up. I had a lot to overcome it, but I was seeking help. I was going to therapy, and in fact, like when we were first, like we were engaged to be married, he was going to like group therapy sessions with me, and that should have been a red flag, y'all, single people. But listen, he was, didn't know any better. I was better. blinded by her beauty. Okay, okay. <laughs> and that's the problem, many people. You get blinded by the beauty in the infatuation stage. Right. But how many of you all know that stage don't last forever? Yes. Right. You know, I, I say all of the time that people. It's like when we first met, she could do no wrong. I'm talking about her food tasted good, her voice yes. sounded sweet, yes. she smelled good, her hands were soft. But after you get married in a few years, it's all of a sudden your food, I, you fix the same food all the time. Your hands are ashy, my God, your voice gets that's on not, my that's enough. last you nerve. I, you know, Ooh, you have marriage has this way <laughs> of ripping off the blind. Y'all, we're four minutes in and we're already <laughs> all the way in. This is good. Well, go ahead. Uh, what was I saying? Um, I think I was just owning my part of it. A depression. Because you were just saying that, you know, you were, you know, you weren't the best. Um, but yeah, I was depressed. And, um, and so it was hard. You know, we were young and married and um, didn't know the right way. But thank God, you know, we, we both found Jesus. And uh, we found a really good church. Yeah. That taught us the word. That's so important. I don't know what we would have done in, in our early years, right? Those two, the, those two years that we were ratchet and crazy, okay? Ratchet. Ratchet. I like words like ratchet. <laughs> Go ahead. It's the message translation. So, so <laughs> in those two years, I mean, we, we joined a church, right? And um, our pastors were like you guys. They were married. They had it together. They taught us relationship principles. And we just kind of followed them and took their word for it. We started doing the word in our life. And here we are today. But yeah, that, that, yeah. yeah that's the short story. I mean, uh, but here where, where we were is that I had a plan to divorce her. Mm. Okay? And I was serious about my plan. Wow. Um, I told my, my dad, hey, get ready. Because you start telling relatives, you're pretty serious. Like, get yeah. ready. I'm about to divorce her. And my dad gave me a two-letter prophetic word. I came to him. I was like, you know, she don't do this, and she don't do that, and she don't do this. And my dad said, so? That's all the oh, man dad. ever said. I'm talking about after 20 years, that's yes. all he ever said. But it registered in my spirit. Yeah. Because sometimes you need somebody to give you a Holy Ghost-filled yeah. so. Yeah. It's a Holy you, Ghost so. A Holy Ghost so. Because you go home and you just rake them through the coals. Well, he don't do this and he don't pay the bills and she don't cook for me and she don't give me none. So? You said this was till death do you part. Yes. And you got to quit making all uh -huh. these excuses and work on your marriage. Because what we realize is that marriage takes work. 
WRK. So and, and watching, and I love, I love the, the, the series is called No Filters. Yeah. Because you can literally get up here and it can be polished and perfect. It could be all highlight reels. Oh, yeah. We I was telling y'all uh, the, before that uh, I had a mutual friend. He's like, man, I remember when we, we hit this spot in our marriage where we only came home because we both lived there. Yeah. Like our situation was so messy. And this is what the enemy does. And I need somebody to grab this. The enemy will cause those moments to cause you to fall into isolation. Yeah. So do those storms isolate you? <laughs> because if you redirect it to the Lord, he will use it to elevate you. Oh, wow. And he will use it to turn things around. Y'all talked about the divine turnaround. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah, for me, it was Jesus. You know, I grew up in a small traditional church. I got saved when I was 11. But for 10 years, I lived as a Christian atheist. I define that as a person who believes in God but lives like he doesn't exist. So if you were to put me in a lineup with 10 of my closest unsaved friends, I drank like they drank, partied like they partied, and slept around like they slept around. But around 23 years old, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And it gave me the power of God to really live fully for God. Wow. That's a divine turnaround. Yeah. And so the reason, now here's the deal. Over the last, we've been married 24 years, 22 years, I've watched no pornography in Come 22 on. years. Come on. I have not even flirted with another woman in yep. 22 years. I've been completely sober for 22 years. That's a divine turnaround. And that's available for anybody. It's available for That's anybody. available. <laughs> that's the thing. It's available for, yes. well, no, not me. You're smarter than me. You don't even know. Yeah you know, where we come from and what we've been through. But God can turn things around if you decide to put them first. And that's what happened for us. Come on, somebody shout divine turnaround. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. yeah. That's so good. I love that. And the reason that we, we love them so much, so many reasons, so many reasons. But one of, the, one of the main reasons we want them to share with you is because, again, we see pastors or we see the amazing influence that they have. We see the integrity with which they live. We see the way that they honor God with their life, honor their family, honor the church, honor their children, have raised them to love the Lord. We see the incredible fruit in their life now. 22 years later, but sometimes we don't get a glimpse of that first two years. Sometimes we don't get a glimpse of that learning process that we all have to go through. And for some of us, it's a little harder than others, but we are all called to be part of a relationship of some sort, amen? You are either, you are either a, a daughter, a son, a sibling, a spouse. Maybe you've been through broken relationships. We are all called to relationships, but the important part is that we grow, yeah. is that we take that. It. it was two years for you all, probably a little longer than that, but yeah. God developed so much in that, and now look what he's done in that divine turnaround. The key word you said is grow. Yes. It's so important in whatever relationship that you're in that you have to grow together, even if it's a friendship circle. If you are growing and your friends are like not growing and they're not learning and getting better the next day and the next day, you might need to find a new circle of friends yes. Come on. because you want people who are growing with you. And that's what we did in marriage, amen. We grew together, and so as he grew, he got filled with the Holy Spirit. We joined a great church, and he started his own relationship in growing with God. I did the same thing. Yeah. I, I was just like, okay, I'm going to learn the Word of God. I'm going to apply it to my life. I said, spirit of depression, you're going to leave me, and it left me in the name of Jesus. Let's go. And for the last 22 years, he's been free. For the last 22 years, I have been depression-free. I was diagnosed with severe depression and anxiety disorder, heavily medicated. I would have panic attacks where I would curl up in the fetal position and just did not know how to exist. But God is able to do what Let's no go. one else can do. And for the last 22 years, I've been free because I chose to grow with God. And you can hear it through two different filters, like, good for you. That's awesome. Y'all have overcome. That's amazing. Sure. What I hear is that God is a personal God. And if God did it for Pastor Tabitha and Ken Clater, he can do it for you. Come on, say, he can do it for me. If you deal with depression, he can set you free. If you deal with anxiety and panic attacks, he can set you free. We believe that. Absolutely. We believe that a divine turnaround, we have access to it as his kids. Amen. We just have to lean into it. Another thing that you said uh, I thought was really great, uh, the last service you had mentioned that in the midst of all of the the warfare and all the chaos that y'all were going through, you had a sisterhood, you had friends that you depended on, and you had a brotherhood, some brothers that you could depend on. Now, you heard me, she didn't have some brothers to depend on, and she didn't have, he didn't have some sisters to depend on. 
Because that's another lie of the enemy. Like, you don't understand. She gets me. She's like my mentor. Like, no, she's not. That's Bathsheba. That is, that is the same spirit that tricked Samson and Delilah. Bathsheba. But unpack that for a minute. The girls that were in your life the, and the brothers that were in your life that helped you in the midst of it. Because y'all are, are talking. You're, you're growing. But then there's still storms. There's still conflict. Yeah, I mean, I think Holly said last week, a Christianity is based upon, it's supposed to be a communal faith. And so you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three, it's a communal faith. And so I, always, I learned years ago that the banana that leaves the bunch is the one that gets eaten. And so many people, they, they isolate their Christianity. Say that again. <laughs> it's like a riddle. <laughs> the banana that leaves the bunch is the one that gets eaten. And there are a lot of people, they're getting their lunch eaten in their relationship and their marriage because, well, I just don't want to keep putting my business in the street. That's why you're, you're getting your marriage beat up and your, your mind, everything, because you need other people where you can confess your faults one to another, yes. pray for each other, yeah. then you will be healed. And so you actually need the people that, that you're sitting beside. And it's, not, it's not just about posting it on social media yeah. with people that aren't really your friends. But you need real people in your life yeah. that will help you and walk with you. And then the flip side, you grow together and then you help them yeah. and walk with them in their situations. And that's why I love small groups. I mean, you just got to invest in the small groups. You have to invest in these relationships. You know, sometimes people come to church and they say, well, man, I just don't know anybody here or something like that. Well, it's because you haven't made yourself known or you haven't been friendly. And so I tell people all the time, just go out into the lobby and just shake hands. Kiss some babies. Love on some people. This is like if you just kiss some babies, you might, yeah, make sure you know those people. <laughs> we got a safety team and stuff. <laughs> How about that you speak into it? Yes, I think, you know, especially for a relationship, when trouble comes or when the storm comes, we're in it together. We both have our umbrellas out. We're like, you know, we're praying. It's so important to have outside influence, someone who is not taking the same hits that you're taking. And so I think it was important, especially for us, you know, when we went through storms, it's like, I didn't, he wasn't the only person that I was going to and, un, you know, and, and unloading on, but I had someone else, another woman of God, another mentor outside of my relationship that would pour into me. Yes. Tabitha, you can do this. Tabitha, I know it seems hard right now, but let me tell you because I've been through this. Yes. Someone who's older, you know, a wise woman to speak into your life. You don't just need your friends, right? You need someone above you, someone below you that you're carrying on. So anyway, it's so important for me. I called on those people in my life to speak into those situations? Well, I think we're, we live in a day and time that doesn't value fathering like they should, and they actually put friends over fathers. Ooh. But the scripture talks more to fathers than it does friends. Matter of fact, you don't find a lot of scripture about friends. You have a couple that iron sharpens iron, but it says we don't have many fathers. You say we have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but not many fathers. That means that when you find a spiritual father and mother, you should cherish it because yes. it's not the norm. And so when people have pastors like you guys who love the flock, that care for the flock, that give their heart for the flock, you all are a gift, and that gift should be cherished. It should be protected it should oh, be you. you know yeah, like that's good. i don't know if they get it y'all understand what kind of passions you guys got here all right so anyway it's amazing so, <laughs> so what we really really felt so strongly we love so many facets of your story but one of the one of the parts of your story that i think is so encouraging are the storms that you've battled especially in the aside from the first two years but also in the not so yeah. not so far behind us and we wanted to talk today about standing together through the storms. I think sometimes we battle storms in relationships and we either do it on our own or we end up fighting one another through the storm. Um, but you have stood together well through the storm. I love, we say it all the time, y'all have heard us repeat it continually, but John 16, the Lord Jesus himself says, in this world, you will have some troubles. You're gonna go through some stuff, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So would you just share some of the personal journey that you have been on through the storm and how you stood together in the midst of it? Sure. Uh, want to start out? No, you go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, we, um, in 2020, y'all know that COVID happened in 2020. That well, what? We, <laughs> we had just moved from Gainesville, Florida, where we planted a church and we had been pastors for 15 years. And we moved from Gainesville to Orlando and we did it all back over again. 
And that was not easy, but our faith was there and it was great. That's what we're doing. COVID hits, we're out looking for another place. In the middle of that, um, Ken's mom gets diagnosed with cancer. We're just believing for her. She starts chemotherapy and all of these treatments and things. And then um, we found a building. We, were, we couldn't have any services, so we needed to buy a building. God did all of these miraculous things, and, you know, we have this building. We go to settle on our building, and I actually couldn't go because I had a doctor appointment. And so he went and signed the settlement papers, and while he was signing settlement papers, I was in the doctor appointment getting diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer. And um, it was the shock of my life. I, we, we were shocked because I'm, I'm a healthy person. I'm gluten-free and dairy-free. And, you know, I, I like to go barefoot All free in the grass. Taste. And yes, free, I free, like free. oils. I'm that girl. You, I have an oil for that. Like, I just we, love it all. We went to dinner last night, and they were like, no, literally, you can eat this. I'm like, I eat this <laughs> he like, was calling all of our food gross. Woo. And that wasn't nice. A nice little. But you ended up liking it. I did. He liked the You can dip cardboard free. in anything. Hits. I put it in ranch. Oh. Some barbecue <laughs> sauce. Love the gluten-free pitas. He did, he did, but he still thinks Funyuns were part of manna. He okay. I did knows we're some, in the word somewhere. I did find some corn nuts in my beard. I haven't had corn nuts since March. <laughs> That's not true. Okay, go back to the story. So I'm so sorry. That's ridiculous. Choices. Back to your good anyway, choices. Anyway. So I was shocked because I'm a healthy person. I, I like to exercise, all of that good stuff. But then after the shock, I got angry because I tend to get angry, but, I, you know, the Lord is working with me on that. Um, I'm redeemed, you know. I'm like the Hulk. You, you all know, like in Avengers, the Hulk. At first, he couldn't con control it, and he's just, ah, angry at everyone. But then he learned to harness it for the good of all mankind. Yes. Okay. So that's me. I like you know, that. I have the Holy that's Spirit. Good. We work through things. She yeah, is the Hulk. Good. Take it from me. Uh, <laughs> 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 anyway. I got mad. And I wasn't mad at God, though, because I know that God comes to give us life and life more abundantly. But the Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Yeah, that's John 10, 10, if you want to write that down. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I got angry at the devil because I was like, how dare you? You have no right to me. How, how dare you touch my body? How dare you threaten my life, threaten my future, threaten my family? Yeah. No, I am victorious in the name of Jesus. Let's go. Come on. I had a righteous indignation like Jesus when he flipped over the tables. Yeah. Like sometimes, if you're going to get mad at somebody, get mad at the oh, devil. Oh, let's God go. is not in sickness and disease and chaos and all of that we stuff. We rented this for the series. Don't, please don't <laughs> flip that over. So anyway... I got mad and I said, you know what, I'm going to believe God and, and we're going to get through this. And so I went in, you know, charging the mountain full of faith. I had a double mastectomy. That is when they remove all of your breast tissue. I had five months of chemotherapy, radiation, um, all kinds of surgeries and things like that. Um, in the midst of uh, chemotherapy, um, I lost all of my hair. I lost my eyebrows. My nails were turning black and falling off, and it, it just hurt. I was in pain. Um, and I remember looking myself in the mirror and not recognizing who I was. And it was like in the midst of it, something broke inside of me. It was like I, I felt like I couldn't hear God the way I used to. And I felt like, God, where are you? I'm, I'm praying, and I, I, when I read the word, it's like I can't find you anymore. And um, in the midst of that, I remember asking God, you know, well, how can I trust you? And because uh, I was like, God, you know, I trusted you that I wouldn't get cancer. How can I trust you that you're going to get me out of this? And God, How many of y'all no, have ever had those thoughts? Like, I think that's real. That's real. You were talking about sitting in that, that room and, and that waiting room or the room like before you went in for your different treatments. And, and we can be overwhelmed. There's so much contending for our attention, but there's also so much noise in life. Yeah. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Psalms 107, 29, it'll be on the screens. It says, he's still, Jesus, he's stilled the storm to a whisper. Yeah. That's still small. The waves of the sea were hushed. Mm -hmm. See, sometimes even in the midst of the noise, we have to recognize that we have an advocate, the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 talks about how he is the comforter. He can cut through the noise of your life, and in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the diagnosis, in the midst of all the things that the doctors and all the people and all the Google reports and all the WebMD say, all of that, he has the ability to overshadow you with, with peace to a gentle whisper. Okay, unpause. Go back. This is good. 
Yeah, that was me. I was sitting in the waiting room thinking, why am I in the chemotherapy ward? I'm the pastor. I should be praying for the people who are sick. Why, why am I sitting here, God? Did I do something wrong? And I'm searching and I'm asking all of these questions. And in the midst of it, I heard God say, Tabitha, does Ken love you? And I was just like, well, yes. Very simple questions. And he asked me three times, does, no, does he love you? No, does he love you? And I said, yes, yes, yes. And he asked me another question. Do you trust him? Yes. If he had the cure to cancer, do you think he would give it to you and cure you? I said, yes, absolutely. He asked me three times. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. He said, how much more will I do for you? Yeah. And it marked me. Yeah. It just... It kept me through the storm. It kept me so that I didn't quit in the midst of it. And then I was reminded of scriptures like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yes, how they were thrown into the fiery pit, the fiery furnace. They weren't thrown in because they were doing something wrong, because they weren't reading their Bible, because they ate all the wrong stuff and did all of the bad, these bad things. They were thrown in because they were doing everything right. They refused to bow down and worship a false image. And sometimes we get into situations, we get thrown into the fiery furnace because we drew a line in the sand and said, for God I live and for God I die. And the enemy wants to come and steal the, what, the anointing that's on your life, right? And so there I was in the furnace, but I knew like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that I am not alone, that there's Let's another go. one in the fire. And so I just trusted that God was there with me and that he would bring me out, not smelling like smoke, like he did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And fast forward it, two years later, I am cancer free. Y'all, my hair's growing back. My eyebrows are growing back. My nails are all back. Glory to God. He sees us through. And you know what's amazing is, is immediately upon the moment of victory and celebration and all that, the enemy, and we can all relate to this at some point in our lives, the enemy will try to come in and steal that seed. Yeah. But the thing about growing in the things of God, Dr. Hagen, who we love, he's one of our overseers, yeah. he talks about buoyancy yeah. and how when storms hit you, they try to affect your shape. Yeah. They try to change who you are. Yeah. They try to change your patterns of recognizing that you can trust God even when you can't track him. Yeah. And so yesterday I was sitting with my daughter and she had this like, She's right there, Finley. And she had this slime. Y'all, this is gross stuff. Like, if it gets on the carpet, I was afraid it was gonna get in my beard. She was, if it did, she was like, you're gonna have to shave that off. And so, you know, you can, put, you can put your finger in it, you can put a pencil in it, and it affects and changes the shape. But if I take that same pencil and push it against a tennis ball, or my little fox had a little tiny little soccer ball, it bounced right back. It didn't change the shape. The thing about the presence of God and the presence of God within you is even when you're affected in life, because in life we're going to go through some stuff. We just talked about it. We have to have strong faith, which challenges our buoyancy, and it didn't change your shape. And then what happens is you came out on the other side stronger. I need somebody to hear this today, that you've survived some storms, so now you're no longer bothered by some raindrops. So when the enemy tries to say, no, no, there's another storm coming, you're like, oh, if God got me through this one, he'll get me through this one. If God showed up and fought for me here, he'll show up and do it for me again there. Come on, somebody should shout. So that it doesn't change your shape. Yeah. That's good. How about from you? What was it? What was the, the way that you stood together watching her walk through that? This is a tough moment. And it's impossible really to feel the weight of the moment just through the explanation. Sure. Yeah. At the time, I'm building a multi-million dollar um, building. Um, I'm taking care of three kids. I'm nursing my wife who's going through chemotherapy. And, um, but what I've learned about the storm is that, you know, some people say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And that's not in the Bible, but it's true. But I'll say it this way. It's the crushing of the olive that produces the oil. Yeah. And sometimes you're like, man, there's a lot of pressure you're growing in the anointing, meaning that you're going to come out on the other side stronger than ever. I had a guy who um, his wife went through similar things, had breast cancer, and he told me that this is going to be the worst thing that's, that you've ever went through. But when you come out, you're going to come out with more power. You're going to come out with a better anointing. You're going to come out with more compassion towards people who are going through the same. That's happened to us. It's almost like, I've heard Joyce Meyer say this before, that she went through a lot of things where she was abused in her childhood. She says, now looking back, I would do it again. I will go through it again if it gave me the platform to help as many people as I'm helping wow. now. Wow. And a lot of people, 
Yeah. A lot of people don't understand that you can actually grow through what you go through. Yeah. You can actually, it's the crushing of the grape that produces the new wine. Mm -hmm. There is something about the fire. It's something about the refining fire. And so, yes. listen, it doesn't feel good, right? right? It's not good, but I'm telling you now, out of that vision, two great things happen. Out of that season of pain, two great things happen. So, I, I can, see, you got a fork in the road when you're going through something. You can either get bitter or get better. Okay. And I said, okay, I'm either going to get mad at God, because that's the temptation. God, why did you take my grandma? Why did you let my mom die? So forth and so on. That's very common. I get it. Yeah. The temptation is, why would you let my wife, who have served you and loved you for the last 20 years, I mean, she's like Holy Ghost Junior, okay? <laughs> she's a holy roller. You know what I'm saying? Like, the only thing she does not do is drive the speed limit, and I'm trying, God. She, welcome to Houston. Lord, I, I am me. working on that. I need prayer. Oh, Lord Jesus. Of None Lord. of these people will pray for you. I can promise that. They're driving around pray. like maniacs. You cannot relate. That's, cannot all. relate. Just, that's a Tuesday for us. You just drive quick. So in my greatest pain, I said, you know what? I'm going to serve God from this moment and hurt the devil bad. You have to make up your mind that when you go through something, you're either going to serve God or serve the devil, but you can't serve both. I said, I'm going to serve God. Come on, somebody. And I'm going to hurt the devil. So I said, what can I do to hurt the devil? And I said, win souls. So out of my greatest pain, God gave me a vision, and this is our current vision of our church to help lead two million people to Jesus over the next 20 years. We talk about it every Sunday. We count numbers every single Sunday. It is all about depopulating hell and populating heaven. That vision came out of my pain. God will take your pain and give you greater purpose. So I got one more. So. Here I am, and I would do a thing where I would walk around my house. Um, we had this lake at my house, and we kind of, I could walk down the street and go to the lake and spend time with the Lord. I would do this about every day, almost every day. Everybody say every day. Every day. Every day. I'm praying and I'm walking. About halfway in, she starts, um, she has so many chemicals in her, and she has this little, it's almost like a panic attack. I mean, it goes back old school. Nurses come in like they don't know what's going on with her. Her body is rejecting chemotherapy. Like, I don't want, it's fight and flight. I got to get out of here. And in my darkest moment, I went to the Lord, and I'm spending time in prayer. And as I'm leaving my place of prayer by the lake, I have an encounter with the Lord. And the best way that I can explain it, it was almost like, have you ever um, had when they infuse your veins with vitamins before? You ever heard of something yeah. like that? Like, okay. It was almost like he shot joy in my veins. Oh, wow. And it was like, and this is the best way that I can explain it. I know it might sound weird, but as I'm leaving my place of prayer, I was overcome with not just natural joy, but what the Bible calls the oil of joy or the anointing of yeah. joy. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. Yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden, the weight began to be light. It, I came to a season where it was like the things that should have stressed me, I had this mantle of peace and this mantle of joy. And I'm talking about you that thing. You know what? Last I remember it. Can uh -huh. I say this? I, I was like walking around not feeling good in the house and I saw him and he just changed. He was smiling. He was so light. And I remember thinking like, okay, does he realize that, you know, what's going on right here? Is there, does he not know what's happening with me right now? It was almost like he didn't understand. I cast my cares to the Lord. And I could see it like night and day, I but know. I was just like, I'm going to follow him because I think he's onto something. Yeah. And pause real quick, because in any scenario, maybe you're in a relationship or a marriage right now where your spouse is, is, is struggling. Uh, maybe it's an addictive issue. Yeah. I remember my mom had that shift. Yeah. My mom found the joy of the Lord, and my the dad's like, what's the matter with you? Yeah. Oh, what are you doing that I'm not doing? Yeah. Because all these drugs and all this stuff is messing with me, yeah. but you have joy. And she was like, no, no, this isn't a joy you can pay for there's nobody there's no dealer for this like this is downloaded directly from the lord yeah. and, and and he ended up gravitating towards it because he wanted more of it so you're in the midst of this fight for your life god is downloading joy and watch how it's contagious yeah, this joy is the joy of Jesus. So it's not just our joy. It's actually his joy that he gives to us through us. Yes. And it's available for all of us. Come on. This is the superpower of the Come on, Christian. shout, I receive this. Come on. Listen, we can go through a recession, but we can still have joy. We can lose a job, but still have joy. You can lose a child, but still have joy. The world didn't give us this joy, and the world cannot take it away. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. So when you feel weak, you need joy. When you feel stressed, you need 
need joy. When you're going through cancer, you need joy. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. It actually gives us, it's a warfare weapon. A lot of people don't understand that laughter, celebration, jubilee, yes. you know, we have the answer for depression and despair right here yeah. in Jesus. Come on, everybody smile real big. Come on. <laughs> like a Pastor Joel Osteen book cover. Come on, just. <laughs> it releases joy. Yeah. It does. God downloading it too. Download it, and it and it got us through this storm. It got and it'll get it'll get us through every storm. I believe that. It, you have to go for it though. You yeah. got to see, search for it. I what love, I love, no, I love that that illustration though, because I think sometimes when we are battling something in life and we have someone that's close to us that is walking with us and encouraging us and holding us up, sometimes we can get annoyed at that other person who stays continually encouraged. We sometimes are like, can't you? see the pain I'm in? Can't you see how difficult this is? And when the word talks about carrying one another's burdens, it's not talking about being downcast because you're downcast. It's not talking about being angry because you're angry. But sometimes when we are in that bitter spot and we're angry about something, we just want somebody to come alongside of us and be angry with us, That's right? Finds company. And that is unfortunately permission to stay stuck. And that is what we're looking for in the natural, in our flesh. We are just looking for somebody to corroborate my story and get that this is difficult. And there's great, there is great power in understanding, but there is even greater power in somebody that understands what God is trying to get to you and is willing to hold your hand and lift you up and walk you to the feet of Jesus because of what they have experienced and encountered in that spot. It's a real gift. How, how did that affect you, though? So you saw me be joyful, and I know at first you thought that I wasn't even, um, you know, like, do you understand what I'm going through? But, like, looking back now, I mean, what was your thought on that? Um, we have a history together, and I trust you. And I knew that you had my best interest at heart, and you, you just had a good track record with me. And so I decided, because I was in a moment where I, I, I felt like I couldn't hear God. I knew he was there, you know, like I knew it, but I, I just, everything was crazy for me. I, I, I didn't recognize who I was, but I knew that you were so close and so touchable, I was just like, I'm gonna follow him. So good. I know he knows what he's doing because you would just speak the word of God with me. Like you just said, misery loves company sometimes. And I knew I didn't need to be around people who were sad and people who were putting, you know, I had a, I wore a wig during chemotherapy when I went outside. Not because like, I don't care. I just walked around with a bald head. I don't, I don't care. Um, but I wore a wig because I didn't like it when people looked at me and would have pity on me or get afraid as soon as they looked wow. at me. I'm like, uh-uh, I'm put this wig on. I want you to smile when you see me because I'm smiling at you and so you know um, let the weak say I am strong and that's what he was portraying and he was being an example for me and I knew it Love so I it. just was like I had to follow yeah, so good two, two weeks ago uh, was it two weeks ago we had uh, the Leonard's Tasha Cobbs and Kenny Kenny was talking about like checking your circle mm. and he said listen if I'm down and I need a miracle I can't have you close to me if you're not going to be standing and believing God yes. for my miracle. If I'm believing God for a financial breakthrough, I can't have you around me yes. if you can't build my faith up and spend time in prayer helping lift up my arms. It reminds me in the Gospels of the paraplegic who's laying on the mat. Yes. Yes. And we can't back theologically how close these four brothers were that lifted his mat up and got him to where Jesus was. We talk about this story all the time because he got... These, these brothers took him right near where Je uh, Jesus was. And Jesus was doing a, a connect group. And uh, <laughs> it was packed. It was like a Hope City connect group, like too many people in the room. And uh, he got them close to Jesus. And it's the only time recorded in the Gospels uh, or recorded in the Word where it says it was the faith of your friends. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an amazing moment how God downloaded that to you. It's like a deposit. And then you were able to help her. And then in return, you were able to help others and the domino effect happens that's so it's good. amazing that's so good so the storm that you all walked through in that situation was was one of life storms was one of the things that jesus was talking about but i think there's another type of storm that sometimes we like to call life storms um but really it's a storm that we cause Ooh. in our own lives and in our own relationships yeah. there's a difference between the storms we have to walk through and the storms we choose and we choose to walk through. So wow. can you encourage our family on um, how to avoid some of those unnecessary struggles in life, in relationships? 
how not to get hung up. <laughs> There's a few people that come to mind right now. They love the Lord, good guys, but they are stuck in a cycle of self-sabotage where it's like even when they get success, they'll do something in their marriage or they'll get a DUI or they'll do something to just mess up the success that they have. We kind of classically call that generational curse, but I would also call it a generational choice yes. because at some point you have to choose to break those patterns and those habits and those cycles and to renew your mind to do things God's way. Uh, what comes to your mind on that? Yeah, I, I agree, you know, with those, those generational curses or patterns or cycles of self-sabotage. It's like you can go from one job to the next job to the next job, one relationship to the next relationship, yeah. one church to the next church. And we think there's something wrong with all of these jobs and churches and other people, but most of the time the issue is... <laughs> It's you. The issue <laughs> like, is you. Like, you're the one causing the problem, and you're the common and, denominator. And we're not even saying that in a hateful way. Mm -hmm. We're saying I've it been there. in a, like a self-aware way. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, I want you to be able to judge your own fruit and say, yes. you know what? I'm producing bad fruit in my relationships. Mm -hmm. I'm producing bad fruit in my, in my, in my finances. I'm producing bad fruit. Mm -hmm. So what do I need to do? to change the root that's producing the fruit. Yeah. And so what I was willing to do, and you've been willing mm -hmm. to do, and many people as well, is to get down to the root mm. and to say, why do I think this way? Why do I perceive that way? And that's when it goes back to community because you need somebody in your life that can recognize yeah. your blind spots. Yeah. You say, well, I don't see it. You can't see it because you're blind to it. You need somebody in your life that will love you yes. enough yes. to say, you got pride. And you need to deal why... with your pride. Yeah. You, you judge people too much. That's why you don't want to be in a small group because you know how them church people. You're talking about church people all around the world because you had one bad experience. Now, every church is like that. That's judgment. That, it's that's, so that, true. That, yeah. And but, so, in, in, in relationships, that's why relationships are so important. Um, any relationship that you're in will get better if you get better. Mm. That's good. If you get better, every single relationship that you're in in your life forever will get better. Well, we say that we have a marriage podcast that we do, and we're about to do these marriage boot camps. And the theme is if you get better, the marriage gets better. If you get better, the marriage will get better. Because many times people go to marriage counseling, and that's fine for communication, family meetings, and all that stuff. But truthfully, if you grew up, the whole relationship will grow. Yeah. If you just got better. So, so the, right. one of the greatest marriage advices that we could give you, and we'll give this to you for free. Are you ready, Sam? Ready? And for those that are going to be getting married in the future, like if you're single right now, you shouldn't just be like, well, this doesn't apply to me. Oh, it like, applies no, no. to you. Write it down. <laughs> it applies to you. The best marriage advice that I can give you is this. Love God more than you love your spouse. Yes. And he will help you love your spouse. So good. We got three people clapping over here, 13 over here. It's a progressive revelation, I know. <laughs> Here's the deal. So many times we, we, especially those of you all who are single, um, we look for people that's just going, does he really love me? Does she really love me? What you want to look for is somebody who loves God more than they love you. That is so good. Because That's a drop the, the reason that I love her is because it's his daughter. The reason I submit to her is because I submit to God. The reason that I honor her now is because I first honor God. So and because I have this vertical relationship that is on point, she receives the overflow of what me and that Jesus is good. Is good. I got somebody. I got one. Rev oh, I got, I got a guy over here. I got one lady in the back. No, no, that gets no, no, me. no. That's good. <laughs> Back, back, just rewinding for just a minute. You, you uh -huh. said generational curses, generational struggles, yep. generational choices. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing because uh, I grew up in a home full of addiction. Yeah. And, and sometimes we, we almost wear these, these things as a badge of honor. Like, well, you know, my aunt, she was a gambler. Right, right, right. And so I deal with that same thing. And we almost wear it. Let me say this. For your family, you have permission mm -hmm. to be the first in your family to do it different. Say that, Pastor. To recognize that those things might run in your family. But those generations, you can be the one that makes the choice that says, no, 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 no. It stops with, with me. That addictive issue, no, 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 no. It stops with, with, my, with my legacy. Yeah. You can be the first in your family. You guys got to receive what he's I'm saying. Telling you, Are you I all feel receiving this? About it. He's prophesying this one. Go ahead, Pastor. He's declaring this no, one. I feel strong about it because yeah. we were talking about some stuff last night in my kids and, and growing up and, and, and a neighbor friend. And again, like this is not a legalistic issue. No. But a neighbor friend told 
Brecken when he was little, like all dads drink. All dads, when, when, when the kids go to sleep, drink and, and get tipsy and, and, and go to bed, pass out. And Brecken was like, what? Yeah. And Brecken was, was ramsacking through our fridge. And I had told him, and I grabbed him. I said, look at me. I said, not in this house. I said, because of what your grandpa went through and what my uncles went through and what all my cousins went through, that stopped with me. That's not going to be something that you have to wrestle Ooh. with. Because that stopped. You have permit. I feel strong about it. You have permission to do things different and be the one that sets the standard yes. because you made a generational choice yes. that says, not in my house. We will serve the Lord. I feel good about that. My God. That is so good. That is so good. I think one thing that we can take from the last thing you said is that the, the grass is not greener on the other side. Not when you are in covenant. Not when you are in covenant with the Almighty. Not when you honor the word that God has placed in our lives. The power and the authority that he has given us to walk in freedom. To walk in wholeness. To walk divinely turned around from our sin nature. The grass is not greener on the other side the grass is not greener in the other relationship the grass is not greener when you get to do something else the grass is greenest when you follow after jesus and you are confident a little more your plan who he has called you to be would you to in closing would you just would you just speak a word of encouragement over relationships yeah, I would. Oh, man, there's so many things running through my heart right now because I sense the presence of the Lord in this place. I sense prison doors being opened and shackles coming undone. And, you know, we're not the smartest people in the world. I grew up in the mountains of West Virginia. My wife here is a mixed chick from the projects of Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Um, I know y'all don't know where that is. It's about 10,000 people in one stoplight in a Walmart. Come on, somebody. But when we fell in love with the Lord, and we decided to be a God first family. All these other things that people desire will be added unto them if they get their priorities straight. I would leave with this one piece of wisdom and it's what I call the palms up principle. And it's for those of you all who are in a storm or if you ever go into a storm and um, our greatest storm, I went to my psychologist and I just told him the things that were happening in my life. And um, he said, when you don't understand what God's doing, when you don't understand why you're going through something, when you don't understand why you have divorce or loss or somebody died or maybe you're being attacked with cancer, he says, when you don't understand it, all you can do is put your hands up and your palms up like this and say, nevertheless, Lord, I trust you. Okay. And what I learned in that moment is that sometimes the highest form of faith is not you just decreeing a thing until it's established, even though that's important. Using our authority is important. The highest form of faith is sometimes when you trust God. That I don't know why we went through cancer. We love Jesus. We've laid hands on people with cancer and seen them healed. We live holy. We have communion daily. Nevertheless, Lord, I still trust you. Matter of fact, could everybody just put your palms up like this? And, and just, this is what we call the palms up principle. Come on, every campus, even the, in the overflow room. Just say this with me. Nevertheless, Lord, I trust you. Meaning that no matter what you go through, no matter what storms you might face, no matter what circumstances you might come up against, put your palms up like this and say, listen, it doesn't feel good. I don't like it. Matter of fact, the Bible says this, but I got that. Nevertheless, Lord, I trust you. And I believe that when we have that posture, there is nothing that God won't do to bless and to multiply and restore. I feel revival winds in this house. And I just hear the number 10. I hear that the Lord, there's going to be a tenfold recompense or a tenfold multiplication happening in this church. And I will be bold enough by faith to declare in 10 months, you'll see it. I'm not talking about 10 months from this point. I think that there's going to be divine multiplication as you step foot into this new building. I think what you see right now is just a small little portion of what God is about to do. And when God begins to multiply his house, everybody who's connected to the house has a spirit of multiplication on them as well. Businessmen, get ready for your businesses to multiply. Those of you all who've been barren in your womb, get ready for your families to multiply. Those of you all who've been struggling in your investments, get ready for your investments to multiply. 
there is a multiplication in this house. And so I prophesy and declare a multiplication of disciples being made that you will not just come to get a word, but you will now transform to come and give a word. You won't come to be served, but now you'll come to serve our communities. I just declare that this will be a launching place to bring hope, not just to Houston, but around the world. I sense the spirit of unity in this house, a spirit of unity for there's a commanded blessing when brethren dwell together in unity. No matter your race, your background, your age, your ethnicity, or what you did last night, if you can just say, here I am, Lord, this is my house and we're a family, get ready to walk in the supernatural blessing of Jehovah. So we declare that over you in Jesus' name. Oof. Come on, can we give God praise for that word? Wow, 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 wow. wow. Y'all, can we stand our feet in honor of Pastor Ken and Tabitha Clater for joining us this weekend? Wow. Oh, did y'all feel the spirit of God? His presence is here. We are definitely a presence-driven church, and we love good music. We love LED screens, but listen, we are contending for the presence of God. This is not just a church for visitation. This is a church of habitation. We believe the spirit of God is in this room and at Katy and at Woodlands. And can meet you right where you're at at home. With every eye closed just for a moment, nobody leaving, just... Yeah, we promise we're getting you out of here. If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Daniel, Pastor Jackie, here's the reality. I need a savior. I've been filling my life up with so many other things, trying to find hope. I've been looking at so many other things. And I haven't found something. Because the truth is you need someone and his name is Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved slate wiped clean throwing your sins as far from the east as the west and i need somebody to hear this today he's not mad at you but he really really loves you he's madly in love with you and no matter how messed up or blemished or barely put together you are he can cause things that have been falling apart to fall into place all he needs is your surrender that's the first invitation the second invitation maybe you're here and you'd say the truth is i stumbled back in here Maybe you're joining us online. Maybe you just found us on YouTube or Facebook, or maybe somebody sent you the link. And today, you have felt the Spirit of God drawing you back because you used to walk with Him, but you fell away. This weekend, God is asking you to fall back in His arms again and rededicate your life. There's been a lid on your life. You can't stop God's blessings and favor, but you can block them. That's where free will comes into play. So whether you're the first invitation, you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time, you're the second invitation, you would say, Pastor Daniel, I want to rededicate my life. Today is your day. He's writing victory in your story. And this is what we're going to do. We won't embarrass you, but we're going to count to three across all of our campuses. If you're watching online, you can say yes to Jesus. Our team will help you. But across all of our campuses. Tanzania to Katy to Woodlands here at West Houston and additional seating. When I hit three, I want you to boldly lift up your hand and say, you're talking about me. One, I want to give my life to God for the first time. Two, I want to rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, throw your hand up right now. We're looking all of us. I see you and you and you and you and you. Y'all, there's a bunch of hands. You and you. I see you both here. I see you in the middle. I see you, my friends. I see you. Let's go. I see you over there. I see you. I see you in the back. Come on, Hope City, make some noise. I saw you. I saw you. Incredible. Listen, God didn't need to see your hand. I didn't need to see your hand. He saw your heart. Let's all pray together as a family across all campuses. Say, Jesus, today I'm making a choice, a choice to surrender everything, withholding nothing. Here's all my shame. Here's all my struggles. Here's all my sin even compartmentalized pain, I'm giving it to you, and I'm asking for your forgiveness. Jesus, thank you for hanging on the cross, swapping your life out for mine, paying the price so that I didn't have to. From this moment on, I choose you. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City. Let's give God praise.